OK, I, I actually didn't introduce myself either. This is perfect. So uh, my name is Dave Grisanti. I work for SunGuard Availability Services. And I'm going to talk about our use of Keystone v3 single sign-on and multi-domain in a managed cloud environment. So a little bit of an overview. I feel like I have something to look at, but I don't. Um, so we, we, need, we had a need for multi-domain, obviously, like a, a need for multi-domain and need for single sign-on support. We were using Horizon. Um, and I'm going to talk about what we did with SSO, Keystone Horizon, policy file updates, why we didn't go with Federation, and then some, some lingering issues we're still having. Time check myself. So why do we need multi-domain at SunGuard? So uh, the platform is a, a mix of managed customers and, um, and public cloud. So we, we, we refer to the projects as either self-managed or managed. And the idea there is SunGuard's traditional business model is IT companies giving us their entire infrastructure and us managing it for them. They shouldn't have control over the VMs to reboot them or stop them or do anything to them. But they, there is some VMs they want control over. So we basically, with policy, basically typed, work pl like, typed projects so that they could be locked down or be open. Um, so that was one thing. And, and again, because of the multi-tenancy, we needed the ability to separate projects out by domains and give them like, a true self-service model where they could go in create projects for themselves, create users, and allow these you know, IT admins, company admins, to, to manage users and projects um, in their environment. So requirements for multi-domain were isolation, as I said, domain and company isolation, um, allow domain admins to manage users and projects. Um, we did this through a, a new role we created called domain admin um, to allow them to do that. And that was also to separate the, the admin role that exists out of the box that you apply to projects and the, what the domain admin role was going to be. So we basically created a, a domain member role and a domain admin role. The domain admin role is you know, primarily used more um, than the member role is. And we modified the Keystone policy file to basically lock down, like, you know, create user and create project to, to individual users um, so that the, the regular you know, kind of unprivileged users in the domain couldn't, couldn't create projects. They can still be assigned an admin role on a project so that they can administer it if they want add new users, you know, do that kind of thing. But um, the domain admins are really the ones that are doing, doing the work at the domain level. So from the Horizon side, the two biggest pieces I think that we had challenges with that we had to change were there was a bunch of upstream patches for multi-domain. And as of last year on Horizon, there was like this just ever-growing patch set. that I think it's at 111 now. So we're on 62. I don't know what the differences between 62 and 111 are. But I know that as of like the end of the year, it still wasn't merged in. You know, to master. So, um, at some point, we'll probably upgrade beyond Kilo, and sure so. and and try to pull as you know, see where the base is at, and pull in what we need. But the the idea is that we're using stuff that's available, you know, out in the open. It's just kind of merged on our own manually. Um, and then from the Django OpenStack auth side, which is the piece, the the Django piece that's handling the you know, pass back from Keystone and then creating the Horizon session, we changed that a bit to handle some. Um, custom error message things that we wanted, but also to really handle the, the SSO pass back and fix, you know, looking up what domain the user's in, because we couldn't, there wasn't any way for us to infer that from our SSO system. Um, so there's a few changes we made around, around Django OpenStack Auth as well. So the single sign on external identity provider, as I said, those two changes we, we made, um, that's really the place where it's, you know, doing the, the token exchange. And then inside of Keystone, we didn't have to really make any, any changes, but we did have to run it under Apache and use uh, the ModAuth OpenOIDC module to handle the, the communication between Apache, you know, between that module and our uh, uh, SSO provider, which is OpenAM. Um, it, the, you could use SAML as well instead of OIDC, uh, but we chose to use chose OIDC. Um, and I'm not sure what the standard is for running Apache if it's or sorry, running Keystone, most people run it as a service or run it under Apache? It seems like it's moving more towards dead, running, so. okay. no, running it as Apache. Yeah. So. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> I know when we got the distribution in Juno, that was, it was, that was not the norm. Right. Yeah. So we had to struggle. Like On DevStack, it was easy to get it running under Apache, but getting it officially running under the other thing was, was a pain. Um, so policy file update-wise, we've customized the policy files a lot, um, mostly for the managed, self-managed thing that I talked about. So. Um, you know, we don't want people basically deleting things in, in certain projects. Um, 
So the, I, this is not in the slide, but the way that we did that is we made a custom token provider, and we have a, a, a basically a flag on all of our projects that say if it's managed or not. And if it's managed, we treat the managed flag like a role that gets passed around with the token. So basically, if it if it you have a the managed role on a project, you know, unless you have a certain other role, you can't you can't do things. Um, the other problem we we had, which we solved, but it's caused us to lock down public access to the Keystone API was the way, at least in my, the, from what I've seen, the way the policy interpretation works is there's this context is admin rule at the top. And that's like this, it's special. Like you can't get rid of that. There's stuff in most of the component code that whatever, you know, evaluates it true there, you can see things across all projects. So the, the default rule is, you know, role admin. So anyone who has an admin role on any project can see things across all the projects in the entire system. So for us, that's bad. Like we've got, we're in a multi-tenant environment. So that basically meant to us, we can't assign anyone the admin role. We're like, oh, this is really bad. Um, so for a while, what we did was we just put the, the admin, the actual admin user from OpenStax ID in the context as admin. So that way there was only one admin, his ID was there, and that way we could still assign the admin role to everyone else and everything worked fine. Because, because the roles aren't special, and if anyone has access to the Keystone API, you can assign any given role to any user on any project. So we've gotten around that now by creating a, a role for operators. That's what we have in the context as admin line. But it means that we, we, we've prevented our customers from creating projects for themselves through the API. They've got to do it through our UI, which is, which is Horizon, but you know, still locking it down to, to the UI. Um, so the, we looked at the federation thing in the beginning, and one of the downsides we've got now is we do have, a, we still have, we're, Keystone's backed by a database, MySQL, on our side. And all of our users are in both the SSO system and in the database. All that we're using the single sign-on system for is just authentication. So that way, the, the pa their password and their username, they're the same both in our database and in the SSO provider. But they don't really have to know that we're storing their user on our side. So, and we're not keeping any other information about them. So it's not like we have to worry about keeping track of changes. It's really just, OK, you told me that this user is who they say they are. Here's their email address. Email address matches in, in OpenStack. Okay, you're good. You're you know you're logged in. Um, and yeah, the federation stuff in Juno was only really group level assignments. We really we needed you know user level control. And then in terms of lingering issues, um, so auth access for the API doesn't work through the external provider. So that's going through the password that they've got stored in the database. So we, we treat that as like an API key. That's what we tell them that it is. And they can reset that independent from their SSO credentials. Um, and then an issue we've seen recently, which makes sense now that you know, we've, we've realized it's there, is that session management has become a pain because we've got this weird mix of Horizon session, you know, immutable keystone token, and then SSO session. So um, normally, you know, the clients, and I think Horizon, if once the token's going to expire from Keystone, it'll get you a new one. But since Horizon doesn't have the initial credentials that the user put in, it doesn't know them. So it just sends our users to, to our SSO system. But our SSO system's session is shorter than the Horizon token, so then they're just logged out. So we've got this weird you know, session management thing, which we can solve by, by customizing the timeouts a bit, but it's, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, and then the third thing, which I, I forgot to put on here, but I was thinking about it before, was the clients were a bit of a mess in the beginning because the Keystone client didn't support V3, but some of the other CLIs did, like Neutron did, and I think Nova might. But you can't use a single source file to talk to the Keystone API and talk to like the Nova API. So we had this like mix of like two week long trying to figure out what a proper RC file looked like to give people to use. And then like some people are using the OpenStack client for Keystone, and some people are using the not, not the Keystone client for everything else. So that's been, that's been kind of fun. Not really. But. Um, so future, you know, once we upgrade past Kilo, Juno, probably look at Mataka at this point um, and see what you know, support is there versus what was there in Juno before. Um, we'd also like, you know, we've got multiple sites. So our original thought was just do some type of database replication to keep all of our domains and users in sync. We don't really want to do projects, but um, maybe something like that will, will come along that'll make that a little bit easier. So that you know, you you know, we we don't want to have to create the users independently in every site and their domain and their domain assignments. 
we want all that stuff to kind of be automatic. Um, and then from the UI perspective, see what multi-domain stuff exists in upstream once we get past uh, Kilo. And that is it. You said I ha we have time, right? So, okay. Cool. Questions, questions, no questions? So we were looking at um, this tool called Continuant. Um, it used to be called Tungsten, I think, for just doing table rep table level replication, and then even within a table, doing row level row level replication. Because like the assignments table is complicated because it holds project assignment, domain assignment, and um, yeah. But we only wanted the domain assignment, not the project assignment, because we don't want to replicate projects. It's been, we haven't actually implemented it, and it's been kind of like one of those things we keep pushing to the side because we don't need it. Um, so, you know, we've toyed with the idea of doing something like ourselves, just listening to Rabbit and replicating the things that we need, but <clears throat> beyond that, we haven't, we haven't done anything seriously. It's going to become a problem, like, soon for us, though, because we've, we've got enough customers that want more than one site, so. And I don't want to have to create their users <laughs> manually. Yeah. With API. But um, beyond that, do you think that there's a use case for having headless users, like let's say for search, whatever users that are not related to an actual person? Yeah. Like that, descriptive roles or something? Or? I guess that's a good idea. Or even like one time, like things that you could use just to talk to talk to the system without necessarily being tied to a like a validated user in single sign-in. Yeah, I guess that's a good idea. The other thing I guess that we considered that I didn't mention is if you have a proper LDAP backend, because so our SSO system is backed by LDAP. So our initial thought was, okay, well we can just use the LDAP backend as the Keystone backend, and then this whole problem will go away. But then we found out that we don't have one LDAP; we have like five, and we've got this aggregator above the, above it that's not doesn't speak active, doesn't speak LDAP. It's just some web thing. Um, so I think that there's probably multiple ways to to kind of get around this, but it really depends, I think, on your company and how the you know what. I don't know security-wise either if that would if they'd be okay with that not being tied to a user. Like I know the one thing that most people want to be able to tie changes all back to a certain person. So. I, mean, I, actually, I kind of like the way AWS solves it because they have the per instance users, right? So you create an instance you can modernize and say, well, give it these credentials essentially in these roles, right? Yeah. That's classic. They will give you stuff in that. Yeah. The, the idea of getting identity. I assume that if you could make that version work, you wouldn't need the copy of the user. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Maybe yes. Yeah. 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 We did, in the beginning we didn't want to do this. It was kind of just what we settled on because of the group and federation, and also again the LDAP thing. I think we would have just went with that if yeah. it worked out. Do, do the users end up with a UID based ID, and they use their credentials as like a username? Yeah. So. Yeah. Their their e their credentials are their email address and 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 their SSL password. But when you look at like. Uh, the, the project, the, u, the user for that project is going to be a UUID that's assigned by Keystone? No, it's like when we do the assignment so for... It's like LDAP? Yeah. It, well, no, it's, it's their email. Their, your username yeah. is their email address, yeah. Username. There's two with Keystone. There's the username and the user ID. Okay, yeah, the user, the user ID is user. Not the ID. Is that, ideally, those are generated by a... LDAP? But, no, by a UUID. It's oh. been assigned to that, so... They are. I guess, I mean, we're using the Keystone APIs to generate the users. Yeah, like we, the u, a lot of times the user already exists in our SSO system, and we're just creating them in Keystone with the same email address, the so same we're just, name. We're formalizing that with okay. what's called the shadow user table. It's okay. something I fought against for a long time. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe rightfully, I might have rightfully lost. I haven't still completely conceded defeat on that one. But um, it makes things interesting. We were just discussing you know, the multi-site. Yeah. Um, what we were doing for LDAP um, was this thing called IDMet. Uh, ID mapping, which I liked a little bit better, which was the SHA-256 of something you got from the SSO system, or mm -hmm. LDAP in this case, and the SHA including the domain ID, so something okay. allocated by Keystone, so that way you don't have clashes and you have some way of distinguishing between Pepsi and the same data center. Okay. I would prefer if we did something like that to generate the IDs, but uh, that and that you can pre-calculate, which will work better for multi-sites. That's so true. That's something else we're going to be discussing in the development side of things here. 
Okay. With, with the shadow user, like, is there any way to browse available users in like the horizon? Let's say you want to add a user, right? So I think with shadow users, what we're going to have is list users. We'll show users who have logged in. Um, which I don't think is sufficient because the, exactly the user the issue he had here, which is I want to allocate a role to Henry before Henry logs in. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we need a way to be able to figure out what ID you're going to get before it goes in there. So unless we pre-calculate shadow users, have some way to, to go in. Now, one of the interesting things we found with the um, the ID mapping is that when you do a user list, because LDAP pulls them all in, it will actually pre-generate all these for you. So a lot of the, the, the issues unintentionally went away. Um, but that obviously doesn't work if your LDAP server is returning thousands upon thousands of records and has a different failure mode if they're only returning you know, a row limit of, say, 20 or 200 or something like that. I mean, just, that's, that's me, sorry. No, just a couple of things, just to, I mean, it's remarkable what you managed to do with, um, with the recent open back you had in Keystone, so I apologize for the <laughs> um, Just a couple of things. So obviously, the federation stuff is a lot better now. Um, there's a bit in the Tarka, and we computer rights to do for that. You mentioned the Keystone client. That is now deprecated. So OpenStack client is the way yeah. to go. CLI from Keystone. Yeah, yeah. Is the way to and it's, and it's fully decreased the client. There is no so, so that's the thing to use in, 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 in later releases. Um, uh, and it's not totally important. It doesn't do everything on every project, but OpenStack client gets a lot closer now than it ever was back in the past days. But it does more of the Keystone stuff than the Keystone client you did before. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Everything you needed to do before with Keystone client, you it can does do with OpenStack client now. Yeah, I don't think I ever used the Keystone client because by the time we started, it wasn't it yeah, didn't work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.